작년에 윤경이가 만 달러짜리인가? 만, 만 오천 불인가? 만 달러, 만, 만, 만 불이다. 만 불짜리 였는데 끝내주더라. <웃음> 여기서 찍으면서 바로 봐. 액정 모니터를 보면서. 소니 건데. 아, 아 이렇게 되셨더라고. 만 달러? 네. 녹화까지 시켰나 봐. 천만 원. 천만 원이네. 소니 건데. 집안채네. 집이 잘 살아. <웃음> 어, 아까 나왔어? 어, 예. 그 나왔고, 여기서 안 나와? 응. 녹화 되고 있거든요. 네. 테이프 뺀거 아니야? 여기 되나 볼까? 아, 뭐, 주 빠진 거 아니야? 이거 뭐야? 금방 뭐, 빠진 게 되는 거 아, 그건 한 거야. 그 충전이 없고. 다시. 테이프 넣냐? 이 건데? 예. 네. 지금 돌아가고 있거든요? 또 이상훈 선생님이 항상 갖고 다니는데 이상훈 선생님이 그런 줄 알았어 <웃음> 근데 방, 방 원래 그 사람 많이 있어요 자기가 보고 나서는 어... 그냥 딴 사람 안 쓰지 뭐 쓸일이 있나 어디 있는 거안 나오나? 아리씨 녹화 되고 있는 거안 나오지? 네한번 누르면 녹화 되고 다시 누르면 정지하고 이거 아닌데 이거 아닌데 사용법은 그 사람이 갖고 있으니 뭐볼 수가 있네 아 캐메라 나오냐? 아니 그 초점에서 안 잡히는 초점을 어떻게 잡으면? 됐죠? 이걸로 사면 되죠 저쪽에 아 거기서? 음, 음, 음. 아니 어떤 거야 이걸로 잡아요? 초점이? 아니 이거 이걸 왔다 갔다 이거 주홍이 이거 이거 빨아 그때 카메라밖에 안 찍는 거 한참 돌리다보면 놀란 상태 있어 어? 내 사진 이런 이씨 미안해요? 응다 <웃음> 지웠을 거 아니야 좀 어둡게 나왔기도 하고 그러네 이거는 뭐 그렇게 안 이용한다. 100 얼마나니까? 오 이게 땡기면 뒤에 아, 아파가고 뒤에 기름처럼까지 이게 줌 기능 같은 거예요? 응. 응. 거의 줌 응. 기능이 이거 이건 이쪽에 있는 거줌 기능은 뭐예요? <웃음> 와. 네, 네. 아그 줌을 누르면 더 커져 아, 더 가까워지고 그러는데? 물어봐서요? 네, 그 여기 판서 판서만 쭉 그냥 쓰면 되죠? 네, 판서 어, 뭐 이런 거 하고 따로 이렇게 돌려도 되고 이렇게 한번 돌려요? 네. 계속 돌려도 돼요? 여기 어디요? 그래서 이거를 그냥 가만 놔두면은 정지하고도 한 5분이나 10분 때마다 한 번씩 그 누르면 레코드가 되고 이렇게 하면 스톱이 되거든. 그거 해줘. 그냥 안 놔두면 가만히 있으니까 안 쓰는 줄 알고 꺼져. 5분에 한 번씩. 한 번씩 가끔씩. 요, 아, 지금 2시부터는요. 원래 선생님이 워낙 그 말씀하시고 싶으신 내용이 많아서 
다섯 개를 방역하시겠다고 그랬어요. 방역. 근데 시간을 두 개, 너무 힘드실 것 같아서 네 개를 짜놨는데, 어, 그런, 그러시면서, 어, 그렇다면 그냥 플렉서블하게, 그, 아까 말씀 주신 그, 디터미넌트 리미퀄리티를 컴퓨터에 사이드에서 보시는 것도 기회가 되면 말씀하시겠다고 해서, 오늘 특히 또 컴퓨터 리스 하시는 선생님들이 많이 계시니까, 요번 시간을 한 시간 반 정도를 잡아서, 원래 계획했던 그, 퀄리터티브 매티치어리에 대해서 말씀을 하시고, 그리고 또 적당한 시간을 그, 저기, 디터미넌트 리미퀄리티에 대해서 말씀하시겠다고. Thank you very much. And hello again. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting several of you. I hope uh, to continue meeting more and more people, and if, I, and if I have to ask your name a second time, please uh, uh, be sure that that shows no disrespect. <laughs> I have no trouble keeping track of everything. Uh, in fact, I apologize for my Korean being so weak, but let me tell you there's progress. Uh, it's infinitely better than it was yesterday. <laughs> infinitely more Korean than it was before. Uh, so what I'd like to do in this talk is give a uh, small survey of some recent ideas, uh, mostly in qualitative matrix theory, uh, but some a little bit more general than that in, in what, what we call combinatorial matrix theory. Uh, and I hope this will give you a little bit of flavor uh, of the subject and some of the kinds of problems that there are and some of the open questions. Um, let me also say uh, that I'd like to dedicate this talk to my uh, uh, very good friend, uh, John Maybe, who, uh, as many of you know, passed away just about uh, a year ago now. Uh, I think it's quite reasonable to regard him in, in some sense as the father of qualitative matrix theory. I know that when I was still an undergraduate, I uh, knew of his work and that had uh, something to do with uh, me getting interested in matrix theory. And I, uh, I became a very good friend of John's and was very, very proud to know him and uh, very sad when he passed away suddenly a year ago. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now I can use, use this point. I can use yeah, that. Oh, is that, that's too high tech for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just I'll try to yes. <laughs> see if this works. Okay. So, um, as I said, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to talk about some ideas that are combinatorial but not exactly qualitative. So let me first uh, indicate what I mean by qualitative matrix theory. I'm sure many of you know it simply has to do with properties that are implied based just on the pattern of the entries of the matrix. And so I've got to tell you what pattern means. And there are two possible meanings. One is that it's just the arrangement of zeros and non-zeros in the matrix, okay? Where I don't care what the non-zeros are. They could be complex numbers, they could be positive, negative, whatever, okay? So by a pattern, I just mean the, the arrangement of zeros and non-zeros in the matrix. By a sign pattern, I mean something a little bit more specific. Now I'm talking only about real matrices. And I mean the arrangement of positive, negative, and zero entries in a matrix. Okay? So in the first case, I naturally associate with a pattern the set of all matrices B, ordinary matrices B, such that the IJ entry is zero exactly when the IJ entry of the pattern is zero. Okay? So it's just all the matrices that have exactly this zero pattern. Okay? Now, in the second case, when we're talking about sign patterns, I simply mean all the matrices that have exactly the same sign pattern as the given sign pattern. In other words, all the matrices that are positive when I see a plus, negative when I see a minus, and uh, of course, by elimination, zero when I see a zero. Okay? So these are the two fundamental objects of qualitative matrix theory, these two sets of matrices. And it just depends on the context whether I'm talking about 
zeros and non-zeros or zeros, pluses, and minuses. Okay, a couple of simple examples. Here's a matrix that's in the qualitative class associated with this sign pattern. Here's another matrix that's in the qualitative class associated with this pattern. Okay? So the, that's the sort of basic background. Now, qualitative matrix theory, which you should regard as a subset of combinatorial matrix theory, Qualitative matrix theory deals with the properties that are either required or allowed based just upon the pattern of the signs uh, or the zero non-zero arrangement of the entries. Okay? So for example, if I look at this pattern or this pattern, I know that the matrix is invertible. Okay? Uh, in this case, I know the determinant must be positive and so the matrix is invertible. And in this case, I also know the determinant must be positive, and so the matrix is invertible. So if I pick any particular matrix with this sign pattern, any particular matrix with this sign pattern, I will have an invertible matrix. Okay? So let me be a little bit more specific. Now suppose you're interested in a particular property, particular matricial property, uh, P, uh, and we might study that property in a qualitative way. And so we say that a, a given pattern or sign pattern requires property P if every matrix in the qualitative class associated with the pattern or sign pattern has property P. And we say that A allows property P if there exists some matrix in the class that has property P. So it requires or allows depending on whether all matrices or some matrices have a property. Now you might say, why, why should I bother talking about those two, those two questions, require and allow, because there is an equivalence, right? I mean, the pattern or sign pattern A allows property P exactly when it does not require not P. And so I could just study one of these. However, it's a lot cleaner and simpler to talk both about requires and allows, and it, it, it leads to some nice, uh, nice duality too. So the general question is the following. You, you pick your favorite matrix property, okay? And then the question is to characterize those patterns or sign patterns A that require property P or to characterize those A that allow property P. And we'd like to do this as effectively as possible. We'd like to do it in some way that perhaps maybe you could check easily. So for example, some, some questions that have been studied, the so-called sign-stable matrices are exactly the, the sign patterns that require stability. Potential stability is the study of the sign patterns that allow stability. And, uh, well, both of these are very interesting. Interesting in the case of, uh, of uh, differential equations, and, uh, uh, and they, they've uh, been cornerstones of some of the applications of the theory. Okay, so that's what qualitative matrix theory is. It's the, the study of what sign patterns require or allow a given property of interest. Now, just a little bit of uh, historical background. Uh, this is a subject that uh, the earliest I know uh, came from economics, uh, and then somewhat more recently from biology and ecology and chemistry, and much more recently from computer science. Um, there's also interesting uh, aspects in pure mathematics and there are connections with all of these areas, all of the major parts of mathematics. And the idea is the following. Why should anyone ever care about this? Well, in, in certain models that you might have in an application, you may know the direction of some fact in the model, which might be a linear model characterized by a coefficient matrix. So you might know some directions of the facts uh, based purely on theory, for example. <coughs> 
but it may be quite difficult or it, perhaps impossible to get precise values of the coefficients, actual numerical values. It may be expensive to get them in the sense of the cost of experiments, or it may be literally impossible to get them. Uh, for example, if you want to know something about a, an ecosystem, uh, uh, you can't really do experiments. You can't see what happens if you dump in 100 pounds of mercury into some uh, bog somewhere. And, I mean, you, 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 will, you will destroy what you're studying, and so it's simply impossible to, to run experiments. Uh, and there are cases like this throughout uh, economics, uh, biology, and chemistry. In economics, for example, you can't repeat the year 1977. Well, you can look at other years and do some econometrics, <coughs> but you may, uh, you may have great difficulty uh, getting enough data to, to make uh, precise calculations of coefficients. Whereas on theoretical grounds, you may know, uh, you may know something about the coefficients. Uh, can you take that information into account and, uh, and learn something about the model? Um, some of the uh, properties that have been studied in some detail are the following, and it's uh, really a very a much longer list than I've indicated here. Uh, non-singularity, we know quite well the patterns that require non-singularity. Patterns and sign patterns. We know the patterns and sign patterns that allow non-singularity. Uh, in the case of stability, the sign patterns that require stability uh, are quite interesting and uh, it's fairly subtle, but, but at least it's all understood now. Uh, in the case of allow, this seems to be a very hard problem. This is the problem of potential stability. And that is still a wide open problem to, uh, to understand potential stability. And uh, Professor uh, uh, Lee and I, San Sangu and I, were uh, uh, talking about uh, such questions in the case of, of complex qualitative matrix theory uh, at, at lunchtime, and, and those were wide open also. Uh, the question of in inverse non negativity, both the allow and require question, are. are uh, reasonably well understood. Semi-positivity, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Uh, there's, there's a fair understanding now. Uh, and you could regard the, the earliest origins of this subject, uh, aside from the applications that I mentioned, uh, as the, the theory of non-negative matrices, which had, the, had its origins in the early part of this century in which we uh, learn quite a bit about uh, spectral properties of non-negative matrices uh, just from the uh, pattern of zeros and pluses in the matrix. So that's a, sort of another natural example. Let me just uh, mention one classical example before I get into some, some very recent things. Um, <coughs> point out some sort of general ideas. So first of all, consider the property of non-singularity. Okay? And uh, let's suppose that A is an n by n pattern now. Okay? And uh, I'm going to look at the allow question. So uh, a pattern allows non-singularity exactly when it does not have a block of zeros, not necessarily in the same rows and columns, but a block of zeros uh, in which the size of that block is too big. In other words, a P by Q submatrix of zeros with P plus Q at least N plus 1. Okay? So I should never see a block of zeros that's that big. And if I don't see such a block, I will, the matrix will allow singularity. And if I do see such a block, it will not allow uh, uh, non-singularity. And the reason is very simple. Uh, the sufficiency of the condition comes from the following. If, if, I, uh, if I see a zero block that's too big, in other words, p by q with p plus q greater than or equal to n plus 1, then let's say I have, uh, let's see, how do I want this? Uh, let's suppose that P is less than or equal to Q for the sake of argument. 
then I have uh, T rows here, and I have uh, this block, which is P by N minus Q. And given this condition, I, I cannot have rank here as much as P. I cannot, I cannot get rank P out of this. Okay? And therefore, in the whole matrix, I cannot possibly get rank N because here are P rows among which I don't have rank P. And so uh, the rank of this matrix has to be uh, less than N, and therefore uh, just this zero block implies that the matrix is not invertible. Okay? Now, if there is no big zero block, then uh, it turns out that I can show that I can find a, a, a non-zero term in the determinant of this matrix okay, by matching theory. And uh, that means that invertibility is possible because I can simply make that non-zero term large and make all the other terms in the determinant small. All I have to do is exhibit some matrix in here that's invertible. qualitative problems are permutation equivalence invariant, and so I need to, to think in those terms. And in, in general, I need to think in terms of transformations, simple transformations on the matrix, which leave, leave the problem invariant. And so let me just mention a few of the, of the symmetries that come up in these problems. Okay? Uh, by a signature matrix, as we saw in the talk this morning, I simply mean a matrix, a diagonal matrix of pluses and minuses. Okay? My, my choice of pluses and minuses on the diagonal. Any such matrix is called a signature matrix. If I multiply on the left or right by a signature matrix, I have a new qualitative, I have, I have a new uh, sign pattern matrix. And uh, it's unambiguous. Uh, permutation matrices, I can multiply on the left and right, and I have a predictable sign pattern. Transposition leaves me with a predictable sign pattern. And so I can talk about uh, equivalence by signature matrices. There are many problems uh, that are left unchanged by such equivalence. Uh, problems about eigenvalues are left unchanged by similarity by a signature matrix. Often I can take advantage of, of this as I, did, as I did this morning in the case of, uh, of the uh, matrices associated with the tree. And then I, permutation equivalence often leaves problems unchanged, as in the non-singularity problem. Uh, eigenvalue problems, permutation similarity leaves those invariant and leaves the sign pattern un unambiguous. Transposition, of course, also doesn't change the, the eigenvalue. So depending on the structure of the problem, one or more of these symmetries may, be, uh, may leave the problem unchanged and may be useful to to keep in mind in terms of organizing the problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is the following. I'm going to talk about these three topics, uh, sign patterns that allow orthogonality, and this is recent work of Charlie Waters. And then I'm going to talk about sign patterns and line sums in matrices. And then I'm going to talk about uh, domain range pairs, so sign patterns of the matrix and of two vectors that are related by the matrix. And this is recent work with me, Hyper Pony, and Dave Stanford. And then since I talked this morning about graphs and matrices and multiplicities, I'm going to substitute for this topic, I'm going to substitute uh, a couple of topics, uh, time permitting. One will be, uh, as was mentioned, some uh, ideas about determinantal
inverse. A transpose A is the identity. Okay? So for example, this matrix is in the qualitative class associated with this sign pattern. And this matrix is orthogonal. And so that means that this sign pattern allows orthogonality. <clears throat> I think you should realize that the question of requiring orthogonality is sort of a silly question, right? I mean, there's essentially no way that a sign pattern could require orthogonality. So, the, so here, the allow question is the only one that's interesting. Um, apparently, this question was first raised by Miroslav Fiedler in a talk that he gave in the 1960s. And uh, not realizing that, I also mentioned it as, a, as an interesting problem in a lecture series I gave uh, somewhere in the 80s. Uh, and then uh, at that lecture series was Paul Halmos who got interested in the problem, and, and many other people have gotten interested in it in, in the meantime also. But frankly, without very much fruit. I mean, uh, there just uh, isn't much in the way until very recently of published papers, and I'm going to tell you what, what there is. Uh, and the reason is it's a very difficult problem. I mean, you, there are certain ideas that most everyone comes to, and then, and then you sort of run into a, a difficult point that's hard to overcome. And we've made a little progress lately. So now, for this problem, there's a, there's a very obvious necessary condition, okay? If I've got an n by n sign pattern, and let me assume that it has no zero rows or columns, because if it has a zero line somewhere, there's no chance of allowing orthogonality. So I'll assume that there are no zero lines. And if I'm going to allow uh, orthogonality, it must be the case that every pair of rows must allow orthogonal vectors. Okay? Um, and the same is true of every pair of columns. Okay? Now what does that mean? Well, this, this pair of vectors allows orthogonality because when I take the inner product, I will have some negative terms and some positive terms. Some negative and some positive, so I'm okay. Uh, this pair of vectors does not allow orthogonality because when I take the inner product, every term is either positive, uh, well, these two are positive, and these two are zero. So there's no way that two vectors with these sign patterns can allow orthogonality, can, can be orthogonal, okay? Now, there's another way that you could be orthogonal, and that is you could have uh, every non-zero in one vector be opposite the zero in the other vector. You could be combinatorially orthogonal, okay? Uh, I haven't listed that possibility here, but that's, that's certainly also a possibility. So roughly speaking, what it means for two vectors to allow orthogonality is that the two sign patterns? in the sense that uh, sometimes I have a zero opposite of a sign, and so I can think of that as a wild card. Okay? So as long as the two sign patterns are not weakly the same, uh, except for the case of combinatorial orthogonality, then uh, uh, the vectors are allowed to be applied. And the question is, is that necessary condition also sufficient? It's a natural question to ask. So suppose now that I have a sign pattern matrix, a sign pattern, and suppose every pair of rows allows orthogonality, and every pair of columns allows orthogonality. Is that enough? Can I get an orthogonal matrix? Well, virtually every person who's thought about this problem that I know of has initially thought so. Uh, that's been a sort of a guess that people naturally make. And in fact, that guess is correct for n less than or equal to 4. And it's not too hard to slug out a proof. I think many, many different people have slugged out a proof of that uh, through n equals 4. And, uh, and you can also show, I mean, there's a, there's a little hint of getting an induction going, which, which most people have noticed. Um, and that's the following. If, if I have a plus minus sign pattern, then this necessary condition, if it applies uh, to, an n minus, to an n by n matrix, then there will be an n minus 1 by n minus 1 submatrix somewhere that has the same necessary condition, namely all 
pairs of rows, all pairs of rows are orthogonal, allowing orthogonality, and all pairs of columns allowing orthogonality. Okay? So you, you think there might be an induction here, because you can make you by the by natural induction hypothesis you can make some submatrix orthogonal, and then you'd like to somehow extend that to the full matrix. But then you think, well, how the heck do you do that? Because I, I can't move things around so easily, maybe, maybe by some algebraic geometric means. But nobody found a way. And there's a good reason that nobody found a way, uh, because this it's not true in general that uh, pairs of rows and pairs of columns along orthogonality means that you allow an orthogonal matrix. Now, the first counterexample to this of any kind uh, occurs when n is 5, and it's a counterexample due to Charlie Waters in, a, in about 1994, and I think the paper has now appeared in LAA in 96. And Waters' example, actually this was not his first example, but, but a, a variant of his first example. And, but in any event, all examples for n equals 5 have some entries equal to 0, in this case just 1. for n equals 5 if you confine your attention to patterns of all pluses and minuses. So you might guess that maybe zeros are causing a problem, and for larger n, maybe things are okay as long as you have only pluses and minuses. Okay. However, of course, as you can guess, that's also not true. So for n equals 6, there are, up to the kinds of symmetries that I mentioned at the beginning, there are exactly two examples of plus minus sign patterns that uh, do not allow orthogonality in spite of meeting the uh, row and column orthogonality conditions. So if you take a look at both of these examples, if I look at any pair of rows, say the first two, so forth, no pair of rows is uh, oppositely signed or the same sign. No pair of columns is oppositely signed or the same sign. So every pair of rows allows orthogonality. Every pair of columns allows orthogonality. Nonetheless, this pattern does not allow orthogonality. Now, you might wonder, how the heck could I possibly know that? And in a moment, I'll tell you exactly, exactly how I know that. But in any event, these are the only two examples for n equals 6 up to up to various sy symmetries, permutation and signature equivalence and transposition. And the reason we know that is the following. Uh, in a research project with some undergraduate students one summer, we, we cataloged for an entirely different purpose all the six by six patterns uh, up, to, up to these equivalences. And so when Charlie Waters and I got together, I had a nice catalog. And uh, we proved a condition that ruled out these guys. And we've actually managed to construct orthogonal matrices for every other pattern in the catalog that met the necessary conditions. So these two guys are it for n equals 6. Okay. So now let me tell you how I know that those two patterns do not allow orthogonality. And the reason is there, there's a more general necessary condition. There's something working back there that uh, nobody noticed until recently uh, that was involved in this problem. And it has behind it some ideas about n matrices. And so let me try to, <coughs> to explain this to you. Um, so suppose I have an n by n sign pattern. And suppose in that sign pattern somewhere I see an all plus submatrix of size P by Q with P plus Q too big, P plus Q greater than or equal to N minus 2. Now this looks a little bit like that non-singularity condition I had, and I don't know of an explicit link, but it's very much of the same flavor. But in any event, if I have too big of a block of pluses, then A does not allow orthogonality. Now let's just, let me just go back to, you see, 
Pi is a plus or minus mean this or plus or zero. Mean. Ah, it could even be plus or minus zero. Could even be plus or minus zero. But uh, I, I, I'd like to talk about this as though it were plus or minus, but with proper care, uh, and it's written down in the paper, you can cover plus or minus zero very well. So there's, there's some care to be taken, but let me, let me take the simple road in, in the talk, and I can show you exactly the subtleties uh, when we talk. We, we also have some other theorems that, that uh, uh, explicitly deal with zeros. In other words, they, they make no sense unless there are some zeros. But this, this also makes sense with some zeros, but, but it's a lot easier to talk about without worrying about that. Okay, so uh, let me go back to my example. And you can see right away what's happening uh, relative to this to the theorem. So both of these examples have a plus block of size four by four. Four plus four is eight, which is two more than six. And so that's what rules out orthogonality here. Okay? Now you can guess that this is somehow a generalization of two rows not allowing orthogonality. I'm sorry, of two, yeah, of two rows not allowing orthogonality. I'll say something about that in a moment. The other thing I want to say is there's nothing really sacred about this all plus block because everything is up to signature equivalence. And so if I have some large block that uh, is signature equivalent to all plus, then that obviously causes a problem too. So, but, but again, I'm, I'm sort of trying to keep keep this as simple as possible to explain. Uh, okay. So here I can see I've said it. you can allow some zeros, you can allow signature equivalents, and a few other little things. Now, uh, this clearly includes, the, as a special case, the, the, what I call the obvious necessary condition. Because if I have two rows that are uh, signed the same, or signed oppositely, then of the signature equivalence, those two rows I can think of as two rows of pluses. So then I would have a two by n block of all pluses, and uh, then, then p plus q would be at least n plus two. So the obvious necessary condition is a special case, so this is some kind of generalization of that. And, and somehow it should feel right to you that having too big of a plus block should cause a problem. I don't, I, I don't know how to justify that other than, I guess, my own personal intuition. But now, let me show you why that, uh, why that condition is necessary. And actually, there's you know, a little work to carry out the details here, but the idea is, in some sense, fairly simple. So let's suppose now that I have this P by Q block, which I've called A1 here, and p plus q exceeds n plus 2. Or, I mean, is at least n plus 2. Now, there's some more matrix down here, right? I mean, a, well, uh, you can think of this in two ways. I could say, OK, here's my matrix A. It's p by n. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that a cannot have orthogonal rows. OK? So if a had some more rows, of course, it wouldn't do any good. Okay? If A were actually square, it couldn't possibly help, because if I can't make the first P rows orthogonal, I can't make all the rows orthogonal. Okay? So you can, you can think of this as just being P rows, where P is less than, less than or equal to N, if you like. Okay, so suppose I have this block, and this inequality means that n minus q is less than or equal to p minus 2. And this is important. So now, if, if this matrix allowed orthogonal rows, then that would mean that the identity would be equal to a times a transpose. And if I do the block multiplication, I get a1, a1 transpose plus a2 times a2 transpose. Okay, that's what a, a transpose is. And that's the identity, so that means this block is equal to I minus A1, A1 transpose, okay? Now this, 
this thing is p by p, right? Because a1 is p by q. And notice also that this block has all minuses off the diagonal because a1 consisted of all pluses. And here's where I have to be careful to worry about zeros. I could have some zeros, and this block would still be all pluses, right? If, they, if there weren't too many of them in a certain sense. Okay? So uh, this block has this pattern. Minuses off the diagonal. Uh, I don't know what on the diagonal, except I'm going to find out in a moment. Because notice that A2 times A2 transposed is positive semi-definite, because it's uh, matrix times its transpose. Okay? So since it's positive semi-definite, these diagonal entries have to be actually positive. Okay? So what have I got here? I've got a matrix with positive diagonal entries, negative off-diagonal entries, and it's positive semi-definite, so it's what we call an M matrix. I, most people probably have a rough idea what an M matrix is, but it's simply a matrix with this sign pattern uh, that has uh, some, a certain kind of positivity property, and, uh, and this one does, but when I say M matrix now, I have to allow the possibility of singularity, okay? Now, furthermore, this matrix is irreducible, right? Because it's off diagonal entries are all negative. So what I have is an irreducible M matrix, and what can I say about its rank? Well, let's see. This matrix is positive semi-definite, but let's see. A2 is p by n minus q. So its rank is less than or equal to the smaller of its sizes, which is n minus q. And n minus q, as I noted here, is less than or equal to p minus 2. So the rank of this matrix is less than or equal to p minus 2. So the rank of this matrix is less than or equal to p minus 2. But this matrix is an irreducible m matrix. That cannot happen. Okay? And that's a fairly simple con uh, consequence of the perron trevenius theory because a matrix with this sign pattern is, a, is a, a translation of minus an irreducible non-negative matrix, so it's, uh, uh, its minimum eigenvalue can have multiplicity at most one. And uh, we've got symmetry here and everything, so, so the rank is... Uh, actually, I don't need, this, I don't need the symmetry. So this can't happen, and uh, I'm using what, what I found to be a very powerful fact, the fact that an irreducible possible singular M matrix can have rank efficiency at most one, and here we found that it has rank efficiency two and there's a contradiction. So now you can see why this block size is so important. Okay? Uh, because that's, it all worked out for these numbers. Okay? So that's how I know that that sign pattern uh, does not allow orthogonality. Okay. Um, let's see, there are some other results here, as I mentioned, and uh, for those who might be interested, it would be a good excuse to, uh, to chat later. I can talk a little bit more about some special things in the case of zeros. Okay, let me go then to my second topic, just so I don't too far behind and talk about sign patterns and line sums. And maybe we should let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll see how good the local currency is here. <laughs> ah, that's strong, strong, strong currency. Okay, good. Um, okay, so there's a there's a very old question that uh, came up with Uh, that allow them to be doubly stochastic. Okay? So you can imagine a matrix of some pluses and zeros, and I want to know when such a matrix can be doubly stochastic. Right? Now remember, doubly stochastic means that uh, you're non-negative and every line sum is one. The row sums are all one and the column sums are all one. Okay? And there's a, there's a nice answer to that old question. And the answer is that uh, uh, either A is not reducible by permutation equivalence, 
Or, if it is reducible by permutation equivalence, then it's permutation equivalent to a direct sum of square irreducible matrices. Okay? So either I cannot reduce it by permutation equivalence, or if I can, it's got to be a direct sum up to permutation equivalence. And this is in a, was the entire subject of a paper by Buwaldi, Carter, and Schneider um, in the Journal of Math Analysis and Applications way back in 1966. Okay. Now, here's the question that I want to that I want to look at. Well, I, sh I shouldn't say I'm not really going to look at this question, but uh, this uh, this general question is somehow encompasses the old question and a bunch of new questions. So the, the question that we got onto in, in one of these uh, summer research experiences for undergraduates is the following. So given the, an ordinary matrix D, what sign patterns allow uh, a second matrix to commute with B? So I, I give you B, and I give you a sign pattern, and I want to know when that sign pattern allows the possibility of commuting with the matrix B. Now notice that if B is the matrix of all ones, usually referred to as J, if B is, is the matrix of all ones, then that happens if and only if the matrix A allows constant line sums. The, the sign pattern A allows constant line sums. Now, in case that uh, A is pluses and zeros, then that would be the classical question. Okay? So a very special case of this question is the classical question. And, uh, but, but there are lots of interesting special cases of the new question that one can study. I, I don't know how to answer this general question, but I think it is a, a very interesting sort of mother question to, to, a lot of, to a lot of other questions. And so here's, here's one of the, here's one of the uh, questions that it leads one into. And, uh, and there are others. So suppose A is an n by n sign pattern or pattern. And suppose that you're prescribed certain row sums and certain column sums. OK? So you're given those. And they should meet an obvious necessary condition that the sum of the row sums equals the sum of the column sums. And then the question is, does the sign pattern A, pattern or sign pattern A, allow a matrix with row sums R1 up to Rn and column sums C1 up to Cn. So what sign patterns or what patterns allow given line sums? Okay? So again, the classical question is a very special case of this. And this is also a special case of the commutativity question that I mentioned. Okay, now there's some, again, as usual, there's some obvious necessary conditions. Um, so let's, let's think about the sign pattern case for the moment. And let's consider the example of this sign pattern, two pluses, minus, and plus. Okay? Now I claim that this sign pattern does not allow the row sums one and two and column sums two and one. Okay? And the reason is fairly simple. If I were to have row sum one, the first row sum one, and first column sum Two, let's think about that. Well, uh, row sum one is made up of two numbers, one of which is positive and the other of which is positive. But then the same, one of those same positive numbers plus a negative number has to be two. Well, that, that can't happen, right? There's no way that can happen. Because R1 minus C1 is simply the difference between this entry and this entry. So that's a plus, minus, a minus, which is positive. So, so that difference has to be positive. But in our case, that difference is negative, namely 1 minus 2. So that can't happen. Okay? Well, I think you can see that that leads to some sort of general necessary condition. And so let me, let me state that. And this, I'm going to use this notation, which I realized I didn't record anywhere. So if I have a, a matrix A, 
then square brackets S comma T will simply denote the submatrix of A that lies in the rows S and columns T. Okay? Only now my index sets are alphas and betas and their complements. Okay? So here's the, uh, the necessary condition that I get. Uh, suppose A is an n by n sign pattern, and I want a, a non-degeneracy condition. So I, uh, I shall make a bipartite graph uh, from uh, row, vec row indices and column indices in the usual way. And I want that graph to be connected. So if you don't know what that means, just don't worry about it too much. It's a non-degeneracy condition. And in fact, it's rather unimportant because if that graph isn't connected, then I can break the thing up under permutation equivalence and look at two separate problems. So it's really, it really uh, doesn't matter very much. Okay, so if I have two submatrices of A in complementary positions that happen to be weakly oppositely signed, that is, one of these submatrices is, say, non-negative, and the other submatrix is non-positive entry-wise, then the sum of the row sums corresponding to the alpha index indices minus the sum of the column sums corresponding to the beta indices must have a certain sign that corresponds to the way these two blocks are signed. In particular, in the example uh, that I mentioned here, non-negative and non-positive, then uh, this difference would have to be positive. And now you can see the small influence of this non-degeneracy condition. This non-degeneracy condition means that it can't be that both of these blocks are all zero. Okay? Can't be that they're both all zero. And so I get a strict condition here. Okay? So you can see why this is true just by looking at the matrix. And now I've permuted so that all the alpha indices come first and all the beta indices come first just to make this simple. So for example, if the alpha beta complement block was non-negative and the alpha complement beta block was non-positive, then when I take these row sums, that's this batch, minus these column sums, I just have the sum of the entries in this block minus the sum of the entries in this block uh, must be non-negative. Uh, in fact, must be positive because not both of these can be zero. Okay? So this sum must have a certain sign that follows the sign of those blocks. And by the way, it's very easy to have this situation occur in a sign pattern matrix, especially if there are lots of zeros. So very, very commonly there will be uh, such conditions. OK, so that's a sort of, a sort of obvious necessary condition in the sign pattern case. And now let me mention the, the sort of obvious condition in the pattern case. So let's take this example. Let's suppose I have non-zero, non-zero, zero, and non-zero as my pattern. And I claim that this pattern does not allow row sums 1 and minus 2 and column sums 1 and minus 2. Okay? And the reason is, again, rather similar. If it did, then I would have that what? Let's see. Uh, R1 minus C1, which is 0, would have to be this minus this, which is this minus this. So A12 minus A21, which is a non 0 minus 0, which is a non 0. Okay? And that's all I know about this that's non 0. And since this is 0, then that's a contradiction. You can't possibly have that happen. So there is a condition which is now slightly more delicate. Instead of an inequality, I have a, uh, something less than non-zero. In the general case, we get what we often refer to as, as the single star condition. So if this submatrix and this submatrix collectively have exactly one non-zero, Okay. then the corresponding row sums must equal, I'm sorry, cannot equal the corresponding column sums. And the proof is more or less the same. Uh, I take the row sums alpha 
minus the column sums beta, and notice that I have the sum of the entries here minus the sum of the entries here. If there's only one non-zero among those, then that difference must be non-zero. And so the sum of the row sums must be different from the sum of the column sums. And that was exactly the nature of the problem here. I had a row sum equal to a column sum when they couldn't be equal. by just looking at groups of rows and groups of columns. Uh, and uh, in fact, it's a special case of what I just said. Uh, it's not so obvious to see the sufficiency. Uh, it takes a little work to do that. In that case, it was a linear programming problem in the classical case. Here, it's something more, uh, something a little more uh, subtle than a, than a straightforward than but in, in any event, in either case, in the pattern case or the sign pattern case, the necessary conditions that I've mentioned are sufficient as long as I have this non-degeneracy uh, uh, condition, which, which, as I said, is not, not very important. Now, interestingly enough, you, you would think that maybe there should be some parallel between the proofs. I mean, the things we're dealing with here are not so different. One is patterns, one is sign patterns. You'd think there ought to be a kind of unified proof. I don't know of one. In the sign patterns case, the proof is rather complicated. I mean, there's a lot of bookkeeping to do. And th this is the proof of sufficiency now. And as far as I can tell, you need to use something like network flow theory. It's not, it's not easy to do it. Well, I, I don't know of a way to do it just using linear systems somehow. I mean. In some sense, this is linear systems, but it's using some fairly sophisticated results of linear systems. So uh, the proof is, is along the line of using the network flow theory uh, in the sign pattern case. In the pattern case, we have a rather more elementary proof in some sense, but we have to develop some ideas about uh, the existence of totally non-zero solutions to linear systems. In other words, we have to be able to say, when we write down a linear system uh, in, a, in a certain way, that there ex you know, when does there exist a totally non-zero solution, a, a solution in which every, every component of some solution vector is non-zero. Okay? And so we develop that. And then even still, you have to use some facts about uh, uh, total unimodularity and matrices and, and so forth. So there's... there's uh, still some work to do. But the proofs seem to be rather different at this point, and I don't know. I don't know what to make of that. Now, <clears throat> in each case, there's a, an analogous symmetric question. Uh, and let me just mention that, because there's something, there's a subtlety here that's uh, not yet worked out. So what did I want? I wanted a not necessarily square matrix with given row and column sums, and a given pattern or a given sign pattern. Well, suppose I ask that same question for a square matrix, a square sign pattern or pattern, and of course, given row sums that equal the given column sums. And then I can ask, uh, is there an honest to goodness symmetric matrix? So I have a, suppose I have a symmetric pattern, symmetric in <coughs> zeros and non-zeros, or symmetric in pluses, minuses, and zeros, and uh, you know, symmetrically given row and column sums and all that. Does there exist a symmetric matrix? Well, in the sign pattern case, it's almost a triviality to deduce exactly the theorem you would guess from the general result. Because why? Well, uh, I've got this symmetric sign pattern, 
and I know there's a solution, uh, not necessarily symmetric, but I also know there's a solution for the transpose problem because the conditions are the same. And so I simply average the, the two solutions and I must get a, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I average a solution with its transpose and I have a symmetric matrix that's a solution. Okay, it's not hard. And moreover, the key is, since the pattern is symmetric, if I had a plus and an above diagonal entry, it must have a plus and a below diagonal entry. So when I average those entries, I know I get a plus. No problem. Okay? Now, if I try to do the same thing in the pattern case, there's a big problem. Okay? So suppose I simply try to average a matrix with its transpose, but I've got patterns. Well, it could be that the matrix, that the entry above the diagonal, which I only know to be non-zero, is the opposite of the matrix of the entry below the diagonal, which I only know to be non-zero. They could be opposite in sign. And then when I average them, I get them both zero, but that's not allowed because we've got a pattern here and we have to have certain entries non-zero and certain entries zero. And, by the way, that can happen. So, there, there have to be additional conditions in the pattern case only when you talk about the symmetric problem. There are, there's nothing new in the sign pattern case. Okay? So, very clear difference here. Uh, we think now that we know what the new conditions are for the symmetric case for patterns, but uh, we, don't, we don't have a proof yet, so there's, uh, there's something to be done there. Okay. Well, let me, let me go along to my, my third topic then, which is, I think, also a very fundamental one, perhaps the most fundamental one here. And now I simply want to talk about requiring domain range pairs, okay? So the setup is the following. As usual, I have a qualitative matrix, in this case a sign pattern, okay? But in addition now, I'm going to have two vector sign patterns, U and D, uh, corresponding to the row and column dimensions of, of the sign pattern matrix A. And the question is the following. So I'm given this sign pattern, I'm given this sign pattern, and you can imagine that I'm given this sign pattern. Um, and I want to know when this sign pattern requires the fact that there be a uh, uh, matrix uh, in the qualitative class of A such that there exist vectors in the qualitative classes of U and V such that X gets mapped to Y by B. Okay? So three sign patterns given, and so I need three matrices, two of which are vectors in this case, such that this guy is mapped to this guy. And by the way, the case in which I replace X and Y by matrices now of appropriate sizes is also of interest, but, but uh, it's not fully understood yet. By any means. Okay. Uh, well, in some sense, it's fully understood. But anyway, let me not. Let me just stick with this. In some sense, I, I guess I'm. Okay. So let me let me give you a little history here. Uh, there are some existing results. Um, the first that I know of, well, not chronologically the first, but the first that I knew it all, knew about it all was the case when u and v are both all plus vectors, okay? And then Dave Stanford and I, back in uh, 1993, uh, characterized the sign pattern matrices that have the property that there existed an all plus vector that gets mapped to an all plus vector. These are the so-called patterns that allow semi-positivity, okay? Um, allow actually minimal, I know, just semi, just semi positivity. Okay, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And the, it's very, this problem is fairly easy to solve. Okay, because it turns out the patterns have to look like the following. They have to be what we call a generalized positive column, and that is up to permutation equivalence. Um, I should have every, the, the last entry in every row be plus. 
Okay? So maybe I can look like that. Okay? So the right, yeah, the rightmost non-zero entry in every row is a plus. Okay? So that's what we call a generalized positive column. And in order to require that there be a positive vector mapped to a positive vector by any matrix in this class, then you have to be in that form. Okay? So that's one special case uh, that was around. And there's another sort of special case that uh, I learned of more recently. Um, that got me thinking in these more general terms. It's interesting how sometimes there's a kind of an obvious next question and you just don't think of it until you see something else. And this is a result of two Russians, so Davidov and Davidava, I presume it's a husband and wife. And they consider the case in which uh, V is the zero vector and U is entry-wise non-negative and non-zero. Okay? So that is, let's see, since U gets mapped to V, then they're looking at the case in which there's a non-negative, non-zero vector in the null space of every matrix in the sign pattern class. Okay? And so what they proved is the following. A sign pattern matrix A requires a non-negative, non-zero null vector uh, if and only if every left signature multiple, so every time I multiply A on the left by a signature matrix, uh, I get a, a non-negative column somewhere in the matrix. I don't know where. And by the way, notice that this question is a little bit different from my general question because I'm not specifying where the pluses are in U. I'm just saying that U has only pluses and zeros and some pluses but I don't say where. So here's a simple example just to see what the condition says. Here's a rectangular matrix, and this meets the uh, Davidava and Davidava, David and David condition because, well, here are all the left signature multiples. I've written them all down. And when I multiply this times this, I get this matrix. This has a non-negative column. When I multiply this times this, I get a non-negative column, different column. This times this, non-negative column, it's a different column, this time it's all plus. This times this, I get a non-negative column somewhere. Uh, so, uh, uh, this simply shows that this matrix meets the condition, and so by the, by the theorem, uh, any matrix with this sign pattern has a non-negative, non-zero vector in its null state. And by the way, this, uh, this is not such a silly condition because uh, uh, I believe they, they linked it to some applications and since then I've seen some other, some other applications of this kind of thing. And by the way, I first learned of this when it was reported in a paper by uh, Ando and uh, Rivaldi, uh, which they elaborated something on that, on that condition. Okay. So, Now, let's, uh, let's consider one, a third sort of predecessor result, but one that uh, was not around. This came up in chatting with Mihai Bakomi, who was a, a former student of mine. Uh, so now, let me require you to be all plus. This is different from the DD case, because they just require that you be some pluses and some zeros. And it might be that you had to have some zeros to satisfy their condition. Okay, so uh, let's suppose all plus and B is all zeros. And then let me indicate by omega of A the indices of the non-zero rows of A. Okay, so if, if, a, if a row consists entirely of zeros, then, then it won't occur in omega of A. Okay, <clears throat> so this uh, sign pattern matrix A requires a UV pair. That is, it requires a vector with this sign pattern mapped to a vector with this sign pattern. If and only if for every index set alpha, and one up to m, and every beta that's contained in omega of A, 
then if I take a certain signature matrix times A, this is a little bit like the DD condition now, if I take a certain signature matrix times A, I must have, I must find it somewhere in it, a column that is non-negative and non-zero in the beta positions, okay? So this is a rather more careful version of the DD condition, okay? And this signature matrix is simply the signature matrix in which I have minuses in all the positions indicated by alpha and therefore pluses in the other diagonal positions. So for, I've just given an example here. Uh, this has minuses in diagonal positions one and three, and so that's a one. So I get uh, an all plus vector mapped to an all zero vector exactly when every time I take such a signature multiplication, I find somewhere a non-negative, non-zero uh, column among the beta positions, okay? Well, for, for every data that has to happen. Okay, so now we have three sort of special cases of the question I was interested in. And so what's the answer to the question I was interested in? Well, now I have to ask you to sort of swallow a fairly technical looking statement, but I don't see any way around it. And the general case is the following. First of all, I, I can reduce things in a useful way, okay? Uh, by performing permutation equivalence and signature equivalence on A, or relating it to a, to a new sign pattern matrix A0, uh, and if I delete columns of A corresponding to zero entries of U, so, uh, so remember U is a general sign pattern vector, so U has some pluses, minuses, and zeros. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix things up by uh, doing signature multiplication to make all the non-zeros in U pluses and all the non-zeros in V pluses. And then I'm going to forget about the columns of A that uh, uh, correspond to zero entries of U, and I'm going to throw away those zero entries because they won't make any difference in this. And so now I have a, a, a slightly more special problem that's uh, related to the problems that I had before. Now I just ask that an all plus vector go to a plus zero vector with the pluses in specified positions, which I'll call gamma. Okay? And I claim that this is really the general problem, okay? because I can work back to my original problem by re-signing everything and putting the uh, unimportant columns back in A. And now, so what's the theorem? Well, it's, unfortunately, it's still kind of technical even with that, even with that production. So the sign pattern matrix A requires a UV pair with U and V so normalized if and only if for every index set alpha corresponding to the rows and every index set beta in these uh, in this omega of A that I defined before, before such that alpha intersect beta intersect gamma is empty okay so these three sets don't overlap don't have any common intersection then every time that happens, I need this signature multiple of A to have a column that's non-negative and non-zero in at least the beta positions, okay? So if I look in, in some column, in just the beta positions, I'll have a non-negative, non-zero vector, okay? So, well, it's a lot to swallow, but that's it. Now, all the prior results that I mentioned, you can recover from this as special cases, and of course this uh, I claim uh, covers the general problem that I mentioned about requiring domain range pairs. Okay. Now let me uh, sort of change tracks a moment. And uh, I want to give you a taste of something uh, that I'd be happy to chat with anyone uh, a good deal more about if, if, if you like. Um, and I, I said something at the beginning of my first talk that uh, uh, indicated how fundamental combinatorial ideas can be in matrix problems. And this is a really good example of that. 
in the sense that you can pose a problem that appears entirely analytical, and yet down deep, in order to solve it, you have to think very purely combinatorial. And this is the problem of characterizing uh, principal minor determinantal inequalities for classes of matrices. Day. So uh, let me just take a moment to indoctrinate you into my point of view here. So uh, consider some subclass of, of matrices with positive principal minors, so-called P matrices. So I'm only going to talk about matrices that have all the principal minors positive. So I've got some subclass of that. For example, it might be the positive definite matrices, which I'll indicate as PM. It might be the M matrices, which I've mentioned before, which would be called M. And now I mean invertible M matrices. Uh, and it might also be the set of inverses of M matrices, which are uh, certain non-negative matrices. Or it could be the so-called totally positive matrices, which are the matrices all of whose minors are positive. This is a very seemingly a very special class, but a very important class that, that people have worried about a lot lately because of geometric problems, probabilistic problems, uh, quite a number of different kinds of things. In fact, they even come up in numerical analysis in an interesting way. So, um, a very important class. So now I'm going to be talking about uh, little n by little n matrices, and so I'll be interested in the set capital N of indices 1 up to n. And I want to talk about collections alpha of subsets of capital N. So these are several subsets of capital N. And I might have another collection beta of subsets of capital N. Okay? But everything will here will have the same number of sets in it. Okay? Now, I'm going to, I'm going to write funny looking ratios like alpha over beta. Okay, which seemingly doesn't make sense because alpha is a collection of index sets and beta is a collection of index sets. But when I write alpha over beta, I'm going to identify that with the product of all the principal minors. By the way, now, now my notation means that I use the same set of rows as columns. Okay? So this is the product of all the principal minors of A, of the principal minors of A in the positions alpha. I'm sorry, in the positions alpha i, i running from 1 to p, and then this is the product of the principal minors in the beta i positions. Okay? So I'm going to identify this ratio of index sets with products of principal minors, and of course a is going to be chosen from some special class. Okay? Now, just as an aside, there's really a sort of semi-group working in the background here. I can I can multiply these ratios in a natural way. There's an identity where I have the, uh, the empty set plays the role of the identity. Uh, so there's really, in the background, sort of a semi-group here. Um, and I'll say that, that this thing is an inequality if this ratio is less than or equal to 1 when I plug in any matrix from my class. For example, I could say this is a, an inequality for the positive definite matrices if uh, every time I plug in a positive definite matrix, this ratio is less than or equal to 1. Okay? So for example, a, a, a special case that you're probably familiar with is the so-called Hadamard's inequality, which says that the determinant of a square matrix is less than or equal to the product of the diagonal entries. Okay? And that's true in all of these classes that I've mentioned. And I can think of that in my set theoretic terms as n, which is just the determinant of the full matrix, divided by the first diagonal entry times the second diagonal entry, and so forth, times the nth diagonal entry. And now, just to make sure that I have the same number of index sets top and bottom, I need to fill this out with a bunch of empty sets, which is important for technical reasons that I shouldn't, I shouldn't bother you with. So here's Hadamard's inequality written in these terms. Okay? So that's the, that's the business.
Now, once you tell me which class you're interested in, then there's sort of an obvious question, and that is, which pairs of collections of index sets, alpha and beta, uh, are inequality, give me an inequality, uh, alpha over beta. Okay? So what are all the determinantal inequalities in a given class of matrices? Okay? Now, again, there are some obvious necessary conditions. Okay? For example, if this class contains all the positive diagonal matrices, and every interesting class does, then I get the following necessary condition, which, which we refer to as, as set theory zero. And that's simply the condition that the number of appearances of index i among the alpha sets is the same as the number of appearances of index i among the beta sets. Okay? That's all. I have to have i appearing the same number of times in the numerator and the denominator. Now, it's not hard to see that that condition is necessary because what, what does it mean to be an inequality? Well, it means this ratio is less than or equal to 1 for all matrices. If I choose a sequence of diagonal matrices with the ith diagonal entry either going up or going down, depending on uh, whether i appears an extra time in the numerator or denominator, then I can actually blow up this ratio if I have extra appearances of i in the top of i. Okay, so it's not hard to see that this is a necessary condition as long as I have diagonal matrices to play with. Okay, now there's a couple other necessary conditions that I want to mention um, for very, and they hold for various classes. And to do that, I need a little more general counting than I have here. So little f sub a collection alpha evaluated at an index set S is simply the number of the sets alpha i that contain index set S. So now I look at my collection alpha, let's see, Right over here, I have alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha p, and I look at each one of these and I simply count the number of times that S appears as a subset. And I do the same with the betas. Well, I haven't written it here. But. So anyway, that's little f. And capital F is really the same idea, except I look at the, the alpha i's that are contained in S. So in each case, I simply count. Okay. Now, the two additional set theoretic axioms that I want to mention are set theory 1 and set theory 2. Set theory 1 just says that little f sub alpha at s is always greater than or equal to little f sub beta at s. So the count of the number of times s appears as a subset in the numerator is at least as great as the number of times S appears uh, in the denominator, okay, as a subset. And then exactly the same for supersets S, and that's set theory condition two, okay? But the inequality goes the same, same direction, okay? And this should happen for every index that S, okay? Now, let me, let me not uh, go through it, but it's not hard to show that if set theory condition two, uh, I'm sorry, set theory condition one doesn't hold, then you can blow up a ratio for n matrices or positive definite matrices. Turns out it's not true for uh, totally non-negative. Okay. So here's the. Uh, statements are equivalent. Uh, and this is due to Sean Fulant, who's a PhD student of mine, and Tracy Paul, and uh, myself. And in any event, in the case of n matrices, these three statements are equivalent. Um, if I look at this ratio, then uh, there's a, a strict upper bound on that ratio over all evaluations at n matrices. And in fact, that upper bound can always be taken to be 1 because I always have an inequality over all n matrices. And that either of those happens if and only if 
the uh, pair of collections alpha and beta satisfy set theory 0 and set theory 1. That's necessary and sufficient. So we can now uh, look at any pair of collections of index sets and tell if we have a determinantal inequality for any matrices. And maybe for the sake of time, I won't uh, tell you too much about the proof, but uh, there are a couple of very nice things that happen. Uh, and they're in terms of ratios of this special form. Okay, and these can be analyzed uh, completely, and it turns out that a uh, basic ratio is, well, uh, a ratio is of, you know, satisfies ST1 uh, exactly when it's a product of ratios of this form. So something really nice happens in this semi-group. And let me just also mention that for inverse N matrices, there's an analogous theorem, except now I have ST2 in place of ST1, and this is just a consequence of Jacobi's identity. Okay? And we don't know a complete solution yet for positive definite matrices, and we're getting, but we're getting very close to a complete solution to this problem for uh, totally non-negative matrices. So I'll be happy to chat with anyone more about that. Line. Let me just take my last few minutes and uh, tell you a little bit about semi-positivity and maybe I'll abbreviate the discussion so it's not to uh, keep you too long. Okay. So a, a not necessarily square matrix A, uh, I'll just mention again, is called semi-positive if there's a non-negative vector that's mapped to a positive vector by A. Okay? And I further call A minimally semi-positive if it is semi-positive, but I can't delete any columns and stay semi-positive. And what that means simply is that if this happens, then uh, the X must have been positive. Okay, because if some entries of x were 0, I could delete those columns of A and still have the required domain range relationship. Okay? And by the way, if this happens, then M must be at least as big as M. Okay? Finally, A is called redundantly semi-positive if it's semi-positive but not minimally semi-positive. Okay? So that simply means it's semi-positive and I can delete some columns and still be semi-positive. Now, uh, some time ago, uh, Dave Stanford and I uh, managed to characterize, I'll just put it here, managed to characterize all the sign patterns that required semi-positivity. I mentioned one of these before, redundant semi-positivity and minimal semi-positivity. I guess this is the one I mentioned before. And we also characterize the patterns that allow semi-positivity and allow redundant semi-positivity. And uh, there was sort of a hole here. What are the patterns that allow minimal semi-positivity? And that seems to be uh, tougher. So let me try to very quickly tell you about that. So, two, two facts that are worth noting. In the case of square matrices, then minimal semi-positivity simply means that the matrix is invertible and the inverse is entry-wise non-negative. Okay? This is in a paper by Dave Stanford and myself on uh, minimal semi-positivity. Well, semi-positivity and minimal semi-positivity uh, some time ago. Um, and furthermore, uh, it's been known for a long time now that if I have a plus-minus sign pattern, that that allows a non-negative inverse exactly when the sign pattern is not complementary. That's in a paper by uh, Tom Layton and uh, Herb Robinson and myself way back in 1979. I was just a little boy then. Um, uh, what does complementary mean? Complementary means that up to permutation equivalence, there are two complementary submatrices that are oppositely signed. All entries here plus, all entries here minus. This is in the plus minus case. OK? 
Okay? There, there are things that are known in the plus minus zero case. Okay? Um, and by the way, this includes degenerate cases like an all plus row, because the complementary block is then empty and this condition is vacuously satisfied, or an all minus column, the complementary row is vacuous and so on. So this condition is satisfied. So just to make sure that that's understood. So, uh, another simple observation you can make is that if A is semi-positive and uh, some, some submatrix I get by deleting the row is minimally semi-positive, then A must have been minimally semi-positive. So the idea here is to try to find uh, in A some non-complementary n by n submatrix that does allow minimal semi-positivity, which is the same as inverse non-negativity. So, uh, so I've, I've got this guy, and I want to find some n by n submatrix that's non-complementary. That's, that's the idea. And so, what does it mean combinatorially? That's that's the question. So, in order to describe that. The simplest thing that I know of is to consider a bipartite graph associated with the negative entries of our sign pattern A. Okay? And in this bipartite graph, I have vertex set corresponding to rows and columns. And I get an edge from between a row and a column exactly when the ij entries is negative. Okay? So this is uh, some kind of characteristic matrix, characteristic bipartite graph of the negative entries of A. Okay. Now, a biclique in a bipartite graph is simply a complete bipartite subgraph of G. And complete simply means that I have all the edges from the row subset to the column subset, all possible edges. Okay. And we say that a biclique of G is blocked by a certain edge E if E is an edge of G that is not incident with any vertex of the biclique. So it's completely outside the biclique. And I'll show an example here in a moment. And I'm sorry to hurry a little bit. I should anticipate Don't worry. Time. Take your time. Okay. Yeah. So, so here's a simple example. Here's, here's a biclique in red. Okay, all possible edges from R1, R2, and R3 to C1 and C2. And then there's some more edges. But there's this blue edge that's incident with no, no vertex of either these rows or these columns. Okay? So this red biclique is blocked by the blue edge. Okay? Now, a bipartite graph is called fully blocked if every biclique is blocked by at least one edge. So no matter what biclique I choose, I can find some edge that blocks it. Okay? And uh, please realize that this is exactly what non-complementary means in the plus minus case. Okay? Because if I look at the complement of any minus block, I must have a minus in it somewhere. So I couldn't have a complementary block. Okay. Now, um, so this is an interesting example because uh, I need a really very subtle purely combinatorial uh, lemma and, and theorem uh, in order to do what I want to do, in order to, to make a, a matrix theory proof work. So um, let, A is going to be a plus minus sign pattern again, and I need N to be bigger than 1. Um, 
and G is going to be the bipartite graph of the negative entrance. So, uh, well, this is the observation that I made a moment ago. A is non-complementary if and only if G is fully blocked and also has no isolated vertices. Okay? Uh, what would an isolated vertex mean? It would simply mean that I have a row or a column of all pluses. Okay? Because that, that vertex would not be connected to anything, uh, so there would be negative edges. Okay, okay. so that the, the, the lemma is sort of obvious, but it's the theorem here that's interesting. Um, suppose I have a fully blocked bipartite graph on two vertex sets R and C, and suppose there are no isolated vertices. Okay, so this is exactly what it means uh, to be non-complementary. And suppose I have more row indices than column indices. Then I can find the row index such that when I look at the induced subgraph of G minus R, I, I get something that's fully blocked and again has no isolated vertices. So in other words, if there's a disparity between the number of rows and number of columns, then I can delete a row and get something that's still non-complementary. The proof of this, by the way, is very subtle. I mean, I, I would like to see an easy proof, but uh, it took a lot of work. Okay. So, the bottom line then, which can be proved inductively using, uh, using the ideas I mentioned, if I have a, a plus minus sign pattern matrix with these necessary requirements and I don't have any all plus rows, then A allows minimal semi-positivity exactly when A is non-complementary. Okay. So no opposite sign complementary blocks. And the technical assumptions here are of really no consequence. Uh, and so uh, this, this really covers the all plus case completely uh, and it's still uh, still an open question what to do with the plus minus zero case. Okay, well let me, uh, let me stop there and uh, thank you for your attention and for sticking with me for a few extra minutes. Thanks very much. Uh, any questions, please? I know that I covered a lot of things, but uh, I think that gives you some of the flavor of, of uh, a special qualitative matrix theory and, and how subtle the, the underlying combinatorial ideas may be. Uh, they may be entirely, I mean, very often in this subject, one has to develop new ideas in graph theory or other parts of combinatorics in order to do what you want to do to solve the matrix problem. And that's when it gets really interesting, when, when there's a real strong uh, uh, feedback like that. Uh, one, one question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Professor Bach uh, worked on the minimal semi-positive and inverse uh, non-negativity. Could you suggest one other, the, the next problem that, that we possibly can attack? Well, uh, well the uh, 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 sort of complete description of what to do with zeros. Zero. zero entries is really the big problem. And I can certainly tell you some things about that problem. Some, yeah. uh, but the, the, one of the difficulties is mm -hmm. there isn't such a nice link to the uh, inverse non-negativity question. Mm. You see here I've relied on the inverse non-negativity results and then I've done a lot of other work mm -hmm. to get this. But uh, even given a complete description of the plus minus zero patterns that allow a non-negative inverse, that's not enough to carry this through. Because here it was so nice when I was plus and minus, if you, if you weren't plus, you were minus. And so, so I could describe in one graph all the pluses and minuses. And, and it's not just a bookkeeping problem to deal with pluses and minuses and zeros all, all at once. Uh, so we know some things about that, but we, uh, 
we don't know a complete solution. And that's really the big question. And it, I think it's quite an interesting one. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Professor.